The Big Ten West is the most pathetic, least interesting, and beyond most disappointing division in all of Power 5 football. I mean, watching how Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, Northwestern, and Purdue function is just, it's mind-boggling. It sometimes makes me want to wash out my eyes with soap. Wisconsin is at least somewhat functional, looks like it could have the makings of a top 25 team without a complete change in direction, but even then, they have a quarterback right now who only has three passing touchdowns through six games. So the West is, you don't even want to look in the West's general direction, but here we are nonetheless, and this is an important game because it saddens me to say I think this is the de facto Big Ten West championship game, and it's being held in Madison, Wisconsin, in Camp Randall Stadium, and as expected, Wisconsin is a pretty hefty favorite in this matchup, with Iowa having several injuries, Cade McNamara and Luke Lachey, the Hawkeyes' best quarterback and best tight end, are out for the season. Eric All's doing a great job stepping up in Luke Lachey's role, but Deacon Hill is just... I don't even know how to describe it other than he's an atrocity in the realm of quarterbacking. How Brian Ferentz, even before McNamara and Lachey were injured, how he put together an offense that was somehow worse than last year's debacle is disgusting. That's, that is old fast food in the dump kind of disgusting. It's horrendous. Um, Iowa right now has no, they have no identity on the offensive side of the ball. And that was the same last year. At least Iowa, even when he who shall not be named was the offensive coordinator, at least they had the identity of, we're calling basically the same plays, um, runs, play action, bootleg, etc., and we're going to use our tight ends, but we are going to make you out-physical us to beat us. That was the identity, with whether it was Tyler Goodson or Mackie Sargent or even, hello, competent quarterbacking with Nate Stanley. And Iowa football has not seen an offense that truly matters since nearly half a decade ago. And their defense this year does have some holes. I don't think it is as elite as the previous two or three Phil Parker defenses were. Wisconsin, on the other hand, we'll talk about them throughout this video as well, but a lot of their problems this year are due to identity change, but they do have an identity, at least on offense, which is we are going to run the football, we are going to play solid in the trenches, and you will have to out-physical us to beat us. And they do have some more modern components with Phil Longo running that new air raid scheme at Wisconsin, but Tanner Mordecai hasn't been very successful. And they do have solid wide receivers, but if your quarterback isn't playing well, these wide receivers cannot be utilized. So Wisconsin, their offense is at least slightly better than pedestrian. It's certainly not an atrocity like Iowa's, but to compensate, they don't have the same defense that Iowa does either. Though, maybe that has improved, but nonetheless, both of these teams have their critical faults, and it will be interesting to see which team comes in with the best game plan and which team ends up winning this game. And I think the winner of this game will reach Indianapolis and be crowned at least the Big Ten West champion, though likely Penn State, Michigan, or Ohio State, whoever wins the East, will just cannibalize whichever team from the West makes it in the Big Ten's final year with divisions. But without further ado, welcome back, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam. And before we resume this preview and prediction segment, please comment your thoughts, analysis, and predictions on this game down in the comments section below. And also remember to hit the big red subscribe button and click the notification bell so you can help this channel and this community, which includes you, on a journey to reach 20,000 subscribers by the end of the 2023 college football season. Please like this video as well, 
and check out my Patreon page via the link in the description so that you can support the channel. Your support's never expected, but it's always appreciated. And more importantly, depending on the tier you join, you will get insider access to weekly picks for all top 25 games and occasionally a few bonus Power 5 matchups. And you also will get access to my potential power rankings, which I posted for week 7, it is right now, I posted this morning, where you can look at where all the different teams are ranked, 1 through 69, all Power 5 teams, and how they would fare against each other on a neutral field, and also at, you know, whether X or Y team is at home or away. Home field advantage is factored in into the potential power ranking system and predictions. But enough with that, let's get back to this game. Minnesota and Nebraska, I think, are two other Big Ten West football teams who have a shot at reaching Indianapolis. Um, I think Northwestern, Purdue, Illinois, I think they are practically out of the race. Illinois is winless in conference. Purdue has to face Ohio State and Michigan, and I think they already have two conference losses. And Northwestern, Northwestern just does not have the talent. They do not have a stable coaching situation with David Braun as the interim head coach, and they're less talented than every team they're going to be facing in their own division. Their win over Minnesota was a 21 point comeback upset for a reason because they're not that good they just caught Minnesota slowing down and letting their foot off the gas and took advantage which I give all the credit to that um to David Braun and his roster and his staff but overall I think Wisconsin Iowa Nebraska and Minnesota are the Big Ten West teams who can realistically find a way to reach Indianapolis especially Iowa and Wisconsin, who will be facing off this Saturday. And the reason for that is Minnesota has already lost to Michigan. They also lost to Northwestern. And they have a trip to Ohio State on the road later in November. That likely is going to produce a third conference loss. And with Wisconsin traveling to Minneapolis and with Minnesota having to travel to Kinnick Stadium to play Iowa, and P.J. Fleck has never beaten Iowa in his tenure with the Golden Gophers, I find it very hard to believe that Minnesota is going to come out of the West 6-3 and three in conference, which I think is their best possible case scenario, given that I don't really see them traveling to Columbus and winning with how Ethan Kaliak-Manis is performing at quarterback and how dominant Ohio State's defense is and the dysfunctionality that plagues Minnesota's defense currently. For Nebraska, they lost to Minnesota, and they lost to Michigan, so they have two conference losses. Now, they don't have an Ohio State in their future schedule, but they have a road trip to Madison. They host Maryland, who I think is a top 25 team, and with how tough their November slate is, a game on the road against Michigan State could even be a trap game. And we've seen Nebraska in the past snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, I don't think Matt Rule's teams are that mentally weak. I think they're mentally strong and they're getting physically tougher. But traveling to Wisconsin, who I think is the best team in the West, makes that quest of reaching Indianapolis for the Cornhuskers very challenging. Wisconsin is the only team in the Big Ten West right now that does not have a conference loss. So they're placed right now at this massive advantage in the season. And Iowa is, I'd say, right now, their most likely threat, and they get to host them in this game. This game is being played, mind you, in Camp Randall. And I did a community poll asking all of you who you would pick to win this game, and an overwhelming 83, more than four-fifths of the respective audience who took part in this poll picked Wisconsin to win, and I assume that many of you would also pick Wisconsin to cover. Wisconsin is favored by 9.5 points, nearly 10 points, and they have had their own problems on defense against Washington State and on offense against every one of their opponents except Purdue, who has a very suspect defense, 
and yet they're favored by nearly 10 points. Wisconsin, according to potential power, is a top 15 team. Iowa is still a top 25 team via potential power, and the spread factoring in home field advantage is actually more so in Iowa's favor than the Vegas line, which I think is rather intriguing. But potential power does factor in not just Iowa's offensive ineptitude and the ineptitude of the offensive staff, but it also takes into account that Iowa has a great defense, a great special teams unit, and that Kirk Ferentz is still a proven head football coach who knows what he's doing. And all of these things, and going back to the defense, especially players like Nick Jackson, Jay Higgins, Cooper DeGene, Deontay Craig. A Cooper DeGene also a standout on special teams. He returned a punt that gave Iowa all the momentum in the world against a bad Michigan State team they were struggling against. And also at punter with Torrey Taylor. And they have a great kicker in Drew Stevens as well. All of these things, not just the offensive ineptitude, they are attributed to Iowa. And these are successful things, the defense and the special teams. So if the top 25 power ranking puzzles you, it's very understandable. I myself somewhat disagree with that placement and think Iowa should be lower. Yes, I disagree with my own power rankings at times, but there are reasons behind it because a team isn't only judged by one side of the football. USC is a perfect example of this. I made an edit for a USC versus Notre Dame preview and prediction video that I unfortunately am not going to get to this week. But next week, I think I'll be more organized. I finally, midway through the season, have somewhat of a schedule to work off of, so there will be more than usual preview and prediction videos from here out. But USC is 20th in potential power. They're not a top 15 team by potential power because their defense is so awful. Potential power hates one-dimensional teams, and there's a reason for that. They can't survive, and the ones that do are eventually killed off. See TCU in last year's national championship game. Iowa is that. Iowa is the inverse of USC outside of special teams. Both have phenomenal special teams units. But when accounting for the two sides of the football that everyone and their entire extended family, even those who don't watch football, know, they're polar opposites on the surface. Very much so. Iowa being all defense, USC being all offense. Potential power doesn't like one-dimensional teams. Wisconsin, even with their struggles on the offensive side of the football, and the fact that I don't think they have necessarily an elite defense, they're at least balanced. And potential power likes balanced rosters, balanced staffs, and especially a great head coach like Luke Fickle who won and did miracles at Cincinnati. And right now, his only loss is to a Washington State team that, look, beat Oregon State, beat his Badgers, and they lost by a small margin on the road to a UCLA team that has one of the best defenses in the country, which I wouldn't have expected this at first glance, but Chip Kelly at Oregon wasn't just known for having elite offenses. Those teams were... Fast, physical, you name it, on the defensive side of the football as well, which is why Mark Helfrich fell at Oregon as he kept the great offense together for the most part, outside of some sketchy quarterback recruiting, but the defense just completely fell off the rails. And that's why in 2015, they'd lose in these shootouts or just get destroyed, and then they could turn around and beat some of these better teams like Stanford, for example, because when you're one-dimensional, like Iowa, or especially in favor of the offense like USC, or some of Helfrich's Oregon teams, you have this ridiculously high ceiling. But then you also have this low floor where you think to yourself, where did that hot mess came come from? Like USC last year when they met Utah for the second time around. Caleb Williams gets hurt, and all of a sudden they no longer look like a functional top 25 team. Wisconsin is given a 66.5% chance to win, according to ESPN's FPI, which roughly would adjust to about every three matchups between these two teams. Wisconsin would be projected to win two of them. Iowa is 5-1. and one. Wisconsin, in contrast, is 4-1. and one. The difference is Iowa has one conference loss, a blowout to Penn State, 
and Wisconsin's losses in the non-conference. So if Wisconsin wins this football game, they have a significant, unless there's a three-way tie that goes on, they'll most likely have a three-game advantage over the Hawkeyes, where Wisconsin would have to lose three conference games and Iowa would have to win out for the Hawkeyes to reach Indianapolis. Again, unless there's a massive three-way tie or other circumstances occur, Wisconsin would gain a big lead not just over Iowa, but likely over the rest of the Big Ten West division. So there's a lot on the line here. If you're a fan of any team except for Wisconsin in the Big Ten West and you want to reach Indianapolis or that's something you really care about, you're probably rooting for Iowa here because Iowa looks a lot more beatable than Wisconsin. Wisconsin at moments can have an extremely suffocating and dominant defense that forces turnovers. And then on offense, they can sometimes hum and look like one of the best rushing attacks in the nation. It's sad to see Ches Malusi go down with injury. However, Braylon Allen, he's still healthy. He was one of the best running backs in all of America last season. And with that offensive line, they are going to score points via the ground game. They're going to just churn opposing defenses. So Iowa here in Wisconsin, I think they're pretty balanced, and I think potential power somewhat reflects that. I mean, that eight points in favor of Wisconsin was baking in home field advantage, which was about half of that eight-point total in favor of the Badgers. So on a neutral field, Wisconsin would be favored by potential power from anywhere from a field goal to a touchdown. That could literally be one play that goes in favor of Wisconsin. So these two teams are viewed pretty close together, in fact. And I think there's probably a wider gap from number 14 to number 10 in comparison from number 24 to number 14, looking at things from a potential power perspective. So these two teams are pretty balanced when comparing them. Obviously, Iowa is this completely one-dimensional team that's defense, special teams, quarterback ineptitude. Wisconsin is more balanced, but Iowa, I think, has five positions being tight end, every defensive position, and special teams that go decisively in their favor. Wisconsin has five positions, including staff, that I think go decisively in their favor. Let's talk about most of the offense, which is basically Wisconsin. We'll go over the Badgers first here, because despite their struggles on offense and the fact that they at times have a crisis of identity, Mordecai's passed for a thousand yards. He has three passing touchdowns, three interceptions, a 120.5 passer rating. Mordecai has given the Badgers some mobility at quarterback, though. 153 rushing yards on 47 carries for four rushing touchdowns. He is Wisconsin's quarterback who is not a Lamar Jackson, who is not a Jalen Hurts, doesn't even have Patrick Mahomes' level of mobility. He's not really a true dual-threat quarterback. Tanner Mordecai has more rushing touchdowns than passing touchdowns. I mean, that, that to me is lunacy. This is through six games, by the way. If things hold constant, he'll have six passing touchdowns by the end of the regular season, which is just downright pathetic. He's only been sacked eight times, though, and the Badgers are averaging five yards per carry on the ground with over 1,000 rushing yards on the year, and they have 15 rushing touchdowns. So this team, when it comes to scoring, is extremely run-heavy, and they actually are more run-heavy in their play selection. They have 196 carries compared to 161 pass attempts, and they nearly have more total rushing yards than passing yards, which is rare. So... Luke Fickle and Phil Longo, and I imagine Mike Tressel likes this too because more clock is burned, his defense gets to rest. Wisconsin has, for now, taken a step back, and they're trying to go back to more of the old Paul Christ ways, except it's out of the shotgun, and there is at least some variety and positive variability to it, like Mordecai being more mobile than Graham Mertz, and in my opinion, despite the fact that Mertz was more statistically impressive through six games last year than Mordecai was, Mordecai is a more competent quarterback. And despite the fact that he's only thrown three touchdowns, 
he's only thrown three interceptions. So Wisconsin's offense has improved compared to last year, just not in the way that I necessarily expected it to from a preseason angle. But my subscribers, again, to give them credit, were correct. This is going to take a lot longer, and I'd say perhaps two, three seasons to really build this identity at Wisconsin, because I think this is Mordecai's last year of eligibility, and I doubt any of the backup quarterbacks, whether it's Braden Locke or Nick Evers, will be as good as him next season, or maybe they will be as good as him, which is still a pretty mediocre, below-average Power 5 quarterback. But Braylon Allen has 472 rushing yards with seven rushing touchdowns, and he's averaging 6.5 yards per carry. And Jackson Acker has 96 rushing yards, is averaging 4.6 yards per carry, and he's getting more involved in the run game because of Ches Malusi's unfortunate injury. At wide receiver, Will Pauling and Shimari DK, along with Bryson Green and Skylar Bell, they each have over 100 receiving yards. DK and Bell have one receiving touchdown. The Badgers have three receiving touchdowns. They have a 1,048 receiving yards, and Pauling, DK, Green, and Bell again. Wisconsin is an underrated wide receiver core. The wide receiver core is not Wisconsin's problem. Their problem is their changing identity. This offensive line has been built to power run. It's not necessarily been built for this kind of offense, so the staff and Luke Fickle and Phil Longo probably came in with different expectations, and those expectations just smacked right into reality. And now they're adapting to the reality of their current situation, which is the fact that in the Big Ten, and even more so in the Big Ten West with your talent level, this air raid was never going to immediately work. It never was. But averaging over five yards per carry on the ground and only allowing eight sacks so far, that's pretty good, especially when you consider that Washington State, defensively, the only thing they're good at is rushing the passer. They have highly rated defensive ends. And Purdue, they have 18 sacks on the season. So Wisconsin has faced teams that are capable of rushing the passer. This also shows that they faced some pretty bad rush defenses. But nonetheless, I think they're a good football team. For the Iowa Hawkeyes, they have the advantage at tight end all across the defense and as well at special teams. But before we get to them, I do want to highlight the fact that Wisconsin on the season, 13 sacks, 8 interceptions, a forced fumble, 19 passes defended, and Wisconsin's leader in sacks right now is James Thompson Jr. with 3 sacks, a pass defended, 16 total tackles. Um, Mayma and Jung Mehta, who I had nearly as a first-team All-Big Ten linebacker preseason, he has 1 sack. 18 total tackles, and he also has a pass defended and a fumble recovery. This linebacker room has been impressively deep, whether it's C.J. Goats, um, Jake Cheney, Daryl Peterson, Caden Johnson, Rodas Johnson, whoever it is on that linebacker core, several of them have sacks, many of them have close to 20 or more total tackles, and Hunter Wohler, safety, he has three passes defended and two interceptions. And Ricardo Hallman, I had him as a breakout candidate in the preseason. Four interceptions, a pick six, three passes defended. And last year, he was not a very good corner. Um, so he's taken a big step forward. Wisconsin has plenty of capable players on defense. But I think for Iowa, they have even more capable players on the defensive side of the ball. As Phil Parker has proven... I think, especially in the past two, three seasons, that he's college football's best defensive coordinator. Iowa has nine sacks, 17 passes defended, seven interceptions, and three forced fumbles. Their defense has been performing below my expectations, but nonetheless, Jay Higgins already has 74 total tackles through six games. Nick Jackson is 53. Um, Quinn Schulte has 35. Cooper DeGene has 33. I mean, these are crazy tackle numbers. Iowa's closing in on 500 total tackles, and they've only played in six games. I mean, this defense is on the field constantly, which might be, that should be factored in with the fact that they've had somewhat of a lack of elite status or NFL-level success because Iowa hasn't even passed for a 1,000 yards yet. 
and they have six passing touchdowns, they have five interceptions, and Iowa's average passer rating is a 97.4. Iowa's also averaging 3.8 yards per carry on the ground, and they have 716 rushing yards with six rushing touchdowns. Let's compare some of those numbers in passing and rushing to the 2022 season, where Iowa had 2,000 passing yards, seven passing touchdowns, seven interceptions. Their average passer rating was a 106.7. On the ground, they averaged 2.9 yards per carry. So the ground game for Iowa has improved, but the passing game somehow has taken an even bigger step back, which in my mind is just nuts. Petrus was sacked 32 times last year, and Iowa gave up 38 sacks in total. This year, they've only given up 11 sacks. I mean, the offensive line's improved drastically. A lot of this is Iowa returned all five of their offensive linemen, and the run game's consequentially taken a step forward. But quarterback play is somehow even worse. I, I don't—it almost frustrates me. I, I, I don't know— how that happens other than to assign blame to he who shall not be named, or as some would affectionately call him, um, Prince Ferentz, or Brian Ferentz. I got the Prince Ferentz name from Off Tackle Empire, where someone sarcastically referred to Kirk Ferentz and his son commanding the Ferentz dynasty at Iowa, and it really does feel like that. I mean, who knows if Brian Ferentz will even be fired if he doesn't fulfill his contractual requirements. But nonetheless, Iowa has several impressive defenders. With sacks currently, they're led by Deontay Craig, Logan Lee, and Joe Evans, who each have two. All of those players also have one pass defended and have over 20 total tackles on the season. Iowa's leader in forced fumbles is Nick Jackson, who transferred in from Virginia great ACC player. So far, he's been showing out as a great Big Ten player as well, with a pass defended, a sack, and like I mentioned earlier, 53 total tackles. And we cannot forget to mention Cooper DeGean and Sebastian Castro, who each have two interceptions and two passes defended. Cooper DeGean also have, he has a punt return for a touchdown. And Iowa, whether it's punting, they're solid, and Drew Stevens, He's 13 of 13 on extra points, and he's 10 of 13 on field goal attempts with a long of 53. So special teams and defense for Iowa, and then for Wisconsin, it's more so a much balanced approach with not the same upside on defense or special teams, but still a great defense and even a great special teams unit for the Badgers as well, but an offense that is much more competent than the Hawkeyes is. So... Who are some players to watch? I think these two running backs are extremely important. Both offensive lines are better than their 2022 counterparts, and Caleb Johnson and Braylon Allen have had another year in their respective systems to mature, and they have better supporting casts now. The question is, what can these running backs do to these opposing defenses? Because I think whoever has more possessions whoever controls the clock better. Overall, who can play the more Big Ten style of football is going to win this game. Now, schematically, we probably would think of Iowa seeing that Wisconsin's trying to run this air raid, but remember, Wisconsin still has the great offensive lineman and the proper running back, an elite running back in Braylon Allen, to run an offense that can control clock. They have competent tight ends, wide receivers, Tanner Mordecai, he hasn't turned over the football as much as Mertz has, which cost Wisconsin greatly on the road versus Iowa last year. So both of these teams are capable of out physicaling each other. Obviously, Wisconsin is more likely to wear down Iowa via their offense. Iowa is more likely to frustrate and wear down Wisconsin via their defense, but Caleb Johnson can help with that as well. Caleb Johnson did suffer an injury early in the season, but he came back with fire and speed, rushing for over 100 yards against Purdue. He has 225 rushing yards on the season on 51 carries. He has two rushing touchdowns, and he's averaging 4.4 yards per carry. Last year, he had a late start after surpassing, I think it was Leshawn Williams and another running back whose name I forget, and... Last year, 
he went up the depth chart and he finished with nearly 800 rushing yards, six rushing touchdowns, and 30 receiving yards, only with one fumble on the whole season. So he's an incredibly reliable running back. And the same goes for Braylon Allen, obviously at Wisconsin. 73 carries, 472 rushing yards right now, seven rushing touchdowns. He's averaging six and a half yards per carry. This season, 18 receptions, 64 yards. They've tried to get him more involved in the receiving game. Just hasn't worked out too much. Back-to-back 1,200 rushing yard seasons, though, in 21 and 22, and also 10 or more rushing touchdowns. He has seven rushing touchdowns right now, and I expect him to probably finish with a career high in rushing touchdowns after this season. He has a great offensive line in front of him, and Phil Longo and Luke Fickle are going to do their best job to put Braylon Allen in his best position to help the team win and score points. So I look to both of these running backs to give their teams the best possible chance to win here in Camp Randall. This game kicks off at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so maybe at the later part of the game there will be, you know, an under-the-lights performance, but this isn't a primetime matchup either, and I think this is a matchup that will fly under a significant amount of people's heads because if Iowa wins this game, and I imagine that would be due to the fact that their defense plays spectacular, but also Caleb Johnson is able to pick up first downs and have a great day along with the offensive line, and Eric All will get you know, five, six, maybe seven receptions be potentially the only component of the passing offense like he was against Purdue. If Iowa wins this game, the West is in total chaos. If Wisconsin wins this game, Wisconsin can afford to lose to Ohio State. They can afford to probably lose to one more Big Ten team and... They'll probably still go to Indianapolis, even if they have two conference losses, unless somehow Minnesota wins out or somehow Nebraska wins out, which again would change, that would change how many wins or losses Wisconsin has and even how many Iowa has as well. So there's a lot of different factors that come into play here. I joked about this being the de facto Big Ten West Division championship game, but Really, it's still too early in the season to determine who is going to go to Indianapolis from the West Division, but this will give us a great idea, and if Wisconsin wins, likely due to their offense just pounding the rock, their defense getting pressure on Deacon Hill and also letting him make inaccurate throws and forcing punts, and really doing to Iowa what Iowa typically does to other teams, flipping the field, bruising you, and scoring in a slow, drawn-out rock fight— If Wisconsin wins, then the West will be out of most other teams' reach, but it won't be impossible to bounce back. It'll just require Wisconsin to not be perfect in their final six games. I think Wisconsin's going to win here 23-7. Yes, that implies three field goals, two touchdowns. I think this is going to be a very slow, painful rock fight that probably only becomes out of reach in the second half. Iowa football is a complete disaster on offense. I think they'll turn it over two or more times, and they'll be held to 150 or fewer yards by a great Wisconsin defense. Wisconsin will have good field position throughout the entire matchup, I think due to forcing punts, forcing turnovers, and also their special teams unit, much like Iowa's being inside the top 20 according to ESPN's efficiency metrics. I think that the Badgers offensively will gain 250 or more yards. They'll wear down Iowa's defense. I expect Braylon Allen to get over 100 rushing yards on his own. Tanner Mordecai will probably get around 100 or more passing yards. I don't anticipate him and his receivers breaking down Iowa's secondary as much as I anticipate Braylon Allen, Jackson Acker, and maybe even a little bit of Tanner Mordecai using their legs to wear down this physical Iowa front. So, 23-7 23-7 to seven is my final prediction for this game. Um, really what it comes down to is who who overall has the high, I'd say the highest ceiling, because I think both of these staffs are solid outside of offensive coordinator for Iowa. I think these are one of the more consistent and disciplined staffs in all of college football, not just the Big Ten. So it really comes down to who has the higher ceiling, 
who has more talent, because I think both will come in with game plans that maximize their chance to win outside of Iowa's offense, which even if they had a good offensive coordinator, I don't think Deacon Hill has been developed properly to where even if you gave this offense to Garrett Riley or to Mike Bobo or even to Lincoln Riley, I don't think they could do much with it. So I think Iowa's handicapped by years of bad development and recruiting on offense, and bad schematics are more the icing on the cake. Meanwhile, Wisconsin, they recruited better under Paul Christ, and Luke Fickle inherited a lot of that roster, and he's developed it, and he also brought in his own very capable transfers. Will Pauling, for example, who leads Wisconsin in receiving yards, he was from Cincinnati as one of their wide receivers. So Fickle has used the portal better, and Iowa got a nice tight end, a great tight end, in fact, an Eric All, and a good, or so I thought, quarterback in Kate McNamara, but he's unfortunately injured. Iowa's dealing with injuries all around. Wisconsin is just the healthier, more physical, more athletic, faster, better team, both roster-wise and also I think they have the better game planning ability and better football IQ on staff. So 23-7, to seven, Badgers. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this type of content, please hit that subscribe button, like the video, comment your thoughts down below, and hit the notification bell. Thank you to my Patreon sponsors for supporting the channel, especially my All-American patrons, Spencer Bringhurst and Noah DDLC, and also to my All-Conference patrons, Will Loftus, Gabriel Calendar, Roaming Gnome, and Matthew Sale. All of you guys, you six, I really appreciate your support, and I'm hoping to get more of you. So if you're interested in making picks against the spread and the money line, Potential Power and also myself give weekly picks every Saturday morning. Let me know in the comments if moving that date earlier would make you consider joining or if there's any content that would make you consider joining my Patreon Thank you guys so much for watching the video, and I'll see you all around. Bye-bye.